Well, that's a very kind introduction. Now let's see if I can actually live up to all that hype. Um, so let's just jump straight in, shall we? The, the, the topic of this final session that I've got with you really is, is I've titled it Change the World. You've got a slightly different title in your, uh, in your program, but it's the same principle, right? How do we go out from here and, and transform the culture? And, and why is it so important that we actually do this? Uh, I'm glad you asked. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, but before we do that, just by way of introduction, um, this is my wife. Sorry, this sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Here we go. Uh, this is my wife, Katie. I might need someone to actually click the slides for me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> slides, slides, hello. <laughs> awesome, yeah. So uh, this is my wife, Katie. Uh, we've been married for 15 years. Uh, well, over 15 years now. Uh, we live in uh, Rangiora. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> we live in Rangiora, which is uh, a small town north of, uh, of Christchurch, about 20 minutes drive. Um, we have five children. Sorry, Clint. Yeah, so we're doing our best to try and help Rangiora achieve city status as fast as it can. Um, our eldest daughter, Lucy, uh, is just uh, recently turned 12. This was her and our outside parliament last week. Uh, Maddie and Evie are our twin daughters. Uh, they are 10. Although they said to me, um, they turned 10 earlier this year, and they said, Dad, actually there's two of us, so we're 20. So... <laughs> They're drinking now, which is good. Um, it's legal. Um, this is our boy Nathaniel. Uh, he is uh, he's seven. Um, this is our youngest uh, daughter, Eleanor Teresa Benedicta. And yeah, I know. Don't do that around her though, because she knows, and she's like a little vampire. <laughs> she latches onto you. <laughs> Cuteness vampire. <laughs> Suck the life out of you. Um, and so um, she's our youngest and cutest. And I have one other contractual obligation to my children. Wherever I go. They say to me, Dad, you have to show them a photograph of our cat, Ignatius. So that's Ignatius, our cat. Yeah, again, don't do that around him either. <laughs> He's a bird-killing machine. Um, now, back in New Zealand, uh, I have been working uh, full-time in pro-life marriage and family ministry now for over 15 years. I run my own organisation called uh, LifeNet. Uh, and I, some of you, in fact, some of you I know are familiar faces here. You've been through the Pulse Training Internship, which actually started in New Zealand about uh, 10 years ago. It's called Activate in New Zealand. And, uh, and then it's sort of grown from there into Australia. I probably travel into Australia about six or seven times a year. I think some of you came to Ignite and you heard me speak there. I'm coming back again next year. Um, and so uh, I guess the focus of, of LifeNet, if you could sum it up in a nutshell, the vision of that organisation is, is that my focus is planting and nurturing the seeds of leadership, virtue and ethical concern. Soon. Because the reality is that I think that uh, our culture is in trouble, which is why I've titled today's talk, Change the World. And if I could uh, sum up the state of the culture, what, what I want to do in this session, just to give you an idea of what I want to do, is uh, first of all I want to diagnose perhaps the problem. Now we've only got a short time, so we could spend several hours. In fact, in some of the work that I do, I've, I've got a one hour session just on the issue of why community has broken down in the West. Seven or eight different factors that have all come together at once. That's one hour. We don't have time to unpack that. There's another hour on all the various philosophical thought that has led us to our crisis around meaning and ethics that we have today. So there's a lot we could sort of tackle, but I've tried to tackle just a basic summary, sort of sum up some key points to start with. Then what I want to do is I want to look at why I think we should still have hope, despite the fact that things are a bit of a mess in the West right now. And then lastly, I want to I talk about what I think our response should be to this as Catholics. How do we respond to this well? So to start with a metaphor, if I could sum up in one picture the state of the West, it would be this, I think. This to me is just the perfect metaphor for the state of the West. So I'm a dad, and that means I tell terrible jokes. With each child that I had, my power to tell real jokes diminished, and my power to tell dad jokes increased. And so I can kind of, I have some vague theories about how this man got into this situation. <laughs> They're only theories though because I look at this and I think, how the heck did this happen? What went wrong in this man's life to think that this would be a good idea? Hey kids! And, and so here's the thing. So this is such a beautiful metaphor though for the state of the West. Let me tell you why. You've got a guy who's in real trouble. That is, that is not a happy place that you want to be in. That's in real strife. And he doesn't know how to get himself out of it. Not only that, he, he probably doesn't even really understand how he got himself into this mess. Then he's got a, another guy over here. This is such a perfect photo. Look at him. He's like, um, well, I guess if you do this, maybe we can get out. He's got no idea either. 
But he's offering himself help, guidance, and he's got no idea either. There's a lot of people in our culture like that who think they've got the answer but just don't. It's such a beautiful photo. So well done. And then we've got this lady over here. Now this, please, this is the, the gender, gender of her has nothing to do with the metaphor. It's not a feminism sort of thing, you know. You know, don't read that into it. If, if you want to, you can, but don't, don't read that into it. So, um, so what we've got is this lady who really, she represents kind of like the cynics and the trolls and the nihilists. She's like looking there, just disdain on her face. Uh, oh, look, a bird has joined us. Um, she's looking there, she's got disdain on her face. She's like, what's the point anyway? Who cares? We're all going to die. So just stay there. And then I'm going to get on the internet and I'm going to troll you about your stupidity. And, and sort of, she's just like, this is such a great photo. And not only that, but check this out. This, this metaphor is the metaphor that keeps on giving. Um, because they're in a children's playground. They're adults in a children's playground. And so much of the West now is about superficial rubbish. And it's us. We're stuck in a playground and we're like, oh, we're so clever. Clever stupidity. Um, but, you know, we, we think we're really clever. We're in a playground. And you know what else is missing from the playground? Children. There's no children. Ooh. Oh, I like that one. That was good. Okay, so, um, but this is, as I said, this is such a perfect metaphor for the state of the West. So why are we in this mess? What, what, is, what are some of the things that are going on? Well, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, first of all, I think we have confused what authentic freedom is. We have a huge confusion about authentic freedom in our culture. And what we think is that if we elevate the autonomous, self-choosing individual to the greatest good in society, that's how you get freedom. We have confused freedom for choice. We think if you can choose it, then you are free. And it's an absolute disaster because it is a lie. That is not what authentic freedom is. As Catholics, we understand that authentic can, freedom can only come from what Edmund Burke would call, and Cardinal John Henry Newman, an ordered liberty. You have an order, a society that is first subservient to truth and to goodness and to beauty, and you give yourself to that and you find your freedom that way. Freedom is not... Just do whatever you want, and that will make you free. Let me give you an example to explain what I mean. Imagine there's a piano up the front here, and life is kind of like that piano. There's two ways that I can play the piano. One way I can play the piano is I can say that I think that freedom is about choice, and I can choose to do whatever I want, then I'm, I'm free. And I'm not going to spend time submitting myself to your stupid, outdated laws of music. They're old, hundreds of years old. Why would I listen to that rubbish? I'm a modern person. And why would I... You can't tell me that that's how a D chord is supposed to look. That's just so blimmin' D chord normative of you. And so I'm going to put my fingers wherever I want to and whatever notes I want, I'll call that a D chord because I'm free and I can do whatever I want and I can, and I'm, I'm, it's all about choice. And, and, and I'm not going to spend time delaying gratification. I'm not here for a, a, for a long time, I'm here for a good time. And so I'm not going to spend time learning music theory or practicing or any of that, that's for chumps. I'm just going to do what feels good. I just get on that piano and bash away. Look, I'm even using my feet. Look how enlightened I am. Losers with your hands only. I've got feet as well. It's, it's just, it's, oh, look, I'm free, I'm liberated. My kids are like this. We've got a piano in our lounge and they often approach the piano like this, bashing away. They haven't quite learnt it yet. And they're like, Dad, Dad, it's the Wiggles. And you're like, no kids, that's not the Wiggles at all. Unless the Wiggles are doing death metal, that is not what the Wiggles sound like. And so, and so, um, bashing away on this piano and, and then they have their fun and they leave pretty quickly. Now, that's what our culture says freedom is like. Just do whatever feels good. Man, it's choice, 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 and you're free. That's not freedom, though. Because there's another way to approach the piano. The other way to approach the piano is to say, you know what, maybe there's actually a right way and a wrong way to, to do piano. Maybe those outdated laws of music, rhythm, melody, tempo, they're actually quite important. And I should actually submit myself to those things. And I should actually spend time delaying my gratification. I say a small no now, so I can say a much bigger yes later on. I, for example, I say a small no now to premarital sex, so I say a much bigger yes to the full, uh, profound, wondrous, flourishing, life-giving sacredness of sex later on after marriage. See that? That's delayed gratification. So my friends come around on Friday and Saturday night, they say, do you want to go to the party? And I say, look boys, I can't. I'm staying home to learn my music theory and to, and to, and to practice my chords. And, 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 and I'm going to put my fingers in the right places to play a D chord. There's, there's some really important wisdom here. You know, this is, this is actually, there's something really true. This is what, this is actually the true form of what a D is supposed to look like. And, and, and what happens now when I play the piano like that? All of a sudden I find true freedom. 
I have the freedom, the more I do that, to actually, I flourish more and more. I can start to play Bach or Beethoven or Mozart. I can start to play r and I can, I, I, can, I can write my own music. I can create my own symphony. I have become freer by first submitting myself to truth and to goodness. That's what we believe as Catholics, that we find our flourishing not through just do whatever feels good, but through ordered liberty. It's not through total absolute choice. It's through total absolute surrender. This is what Jesus tells us. If you want to find your life, you first got to lay it down, lay it down, lose it. That's exactly it. And if you don't do that, Christ tells us, you won't find your life. Next slide, please. The next issue that we have in our culture is um, we, because of this confusion about uh, ourselves, it's all about us now. But sort of all about us. Well, a classic example of this is with social media, right? So what we do with uh, social media is we like to broadcast to the world how important we are and all of our opinions and how much they matter. And, and you don't just take a selfie of yourself. You don't tell the real story, though. It's not really all about you. It's all about a very manufactured moment that we have. We don't take a photo of ourselves in front of some old portaloo in Sydney, unless we're trying to make a political statement, of course. Um, but we don't do that, right? We, we, find, we find somewhere really glamorous to take a photograph because we want to show the world how glamorous we are. I'm on Instagram, baby, and I want people to see how important my life is. And I want to be seen with celebrities. So I sit around the center of Sydney looking for celebrities, and I see Hugh Jackman one day having his lunch. And, oh, Mr. Jackman, can I please get a photograph of you, please? My kids love you in that film, um, The Greatest Snowman. They absolutely love it. <laughs> it's Greatest Showman. <laughs> yeah, like I said, Greatest Snowman. And so let's take a photograph, Mr. Jackman. And so you get your fo camera there, and it's got to be just right, though. The camera's got to be on the right angle, get the best light on your face, little duck face, sucking those cheeks, right? And you're in a hurry, he's in a hurry, so what do you do? You just take 70 or 80 photos, because it's a quick one. And then you scroll through those 70 or 80 photos, and you find the one that you think actually looks the best, just, you know, captures the, the you at your best. And then what you do is you add 50 filters to it to make it look even better, and then you put it up on Instagram or Facebook, but you can't just post it like that, that's not enough. You've got to show everyone what a clever, witty raconteur that you actually are and that you're you're just the life of the party. So you've got to have a funny status to go with it. So you're like, um, just in Sydney and I saw Wolverine, lols. And you know, you post that on, online and everyone's like, oh my gosh, Brendan's amazing. He's just living the dream. He knows Wolverine. How does he know Wolverine? I don't. It's a carefully manufactured moment. On social media, you show the best and you hide the rest. It's not really us. It's a carefully manufactured little split second. Here's the thing. The research is now showing us that the more time you spend on social media, the more anxious and depressed you feel about your own life. It's called amplified social comparison. The grass is always greener on the other side, we think. Social comparison has always been with us. How do we know that? It's in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not cover. That's what social comparison, looking over the fence and going, oh, I wish they had what they had, it's much better than mine. Amplified social comparison happens on social media because you spend lots of time scrolling through all these carefully manufactured little split seconds that are not real, and the more time you do that, the more anxious you start to feel about your own life. And you think, my life doesn't measure up. I don't know Wolverine. Why don't I know Wolverine? And it's what we start thinking, even subconsciously. People often say this to us about our kids, you know, you kids that we see your photos online, they're so amazing. I'm like, yeah, you want to see what happens at bedtime in our house. If you think that our family is perfect, come to our house at bedtime. It's like the exorcist at our house at bedtime. <laughs> but it's a reverse exorcism because you want things to come out in an exorcism, right? We want them to stay in their bedrooms. And so if the power of Christ compels you, stay in there! You know, and they don't. They want to come out all the time. And honestly, it, it's, it's just awful at our house at bedtime. And it doesn't look glamorous and it is not fancy at all. And mum and dad are just losing their the plot and everyone's just ah you know it's just it's it's a perfect storm of ugliness but you don't see that on social media you don't see that we show the best and we hide the rest we elevate ourselves all about ego we're kind of like the ultimate narcissists the next thing that we're, we're, we're dealing with in our culture this is a massive issue if I could just have the next slide please is we have authentic community is broken down in the West. Authentic community has broken down. For a lot of people, this event here and the, the lives that you guys are living, probably, uh, uh, most of you I think are unique and that you probably do have community around you still, but a lot of people don't. And it's a big crisis. I have a presentation, as I said, a one-hour presentation just on this issue called Alone Together and how, how community has been lost in the West and why. That presentation, I am now giving that presentation 
all over the place. I'm regularly asked to give that presentation now. Catholics, Protestant churches, the whole lot. Because people know that something has gone horribly wrong and they just can't put their finger on what it is and how we're supposed to address it. But one of the things that happened is we've lost our unifying vision of reality in the West. What was our unifying vision of reality? Christianity. Friedrich Nietzsche was right. We have killed God. And the death of God, he wasn't celebrating that fact. He said the death of God's a bad thing because how will we actually be unified as a society? How will we have our ethics and where will our morality and ethics come from? G.K. Chesterton once said that when man stops believing in God, he doesn't believe nothing, he'll believe anything. Do you know what the fastest growing religion last year, percentage wise, was in America? Satanism. Largest growth. And now I'm not surprised by that because the core tenet of Satanism is do what you want. The autonomous, self choosing individual. It's the original sin played out at a social level. That's what libertarianism is at its heart. It's this, and what's happened is we've lost our unifying vision of reality. We can't even talk about ethics on the same page anymore. We don't have the same language. You ask a group of people in a room what they think human dignity means, you get five different answers because we've lost the underlying concept of where we got human dignity from, the unifying vision of reality, Christianity. And what's replaced it now is relativism and self-gratification that reigns because that's what the ideology of choice demands. It says, no, 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 you can't have absolute truth because that would mean that we should submit ourselves to that thing. There's something bigger than my choices. My choice must be absolute. And I will decide what is true and what is not true. And it is just destroying us. You know, I think that the, the devil does some of his greatest work in this area. Why has he gone after community? I'll tell you in a minute why this is so important, but I think he's doing some of his greatest work because it just so, does such damage and so, such harm. Why does this matter so much? Well, first of all, we are made in the image and likeness of God. You've probably heard this. In fact, we heard it yesterday. We're made in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked because it's a very important question. If we're made in some, something or someone's image, we should understand what that means because it has a lot of ramifications for who we are and how we find our flourishing as human beings. First of all, you've probably all heard this before. God is love. Who's heard that? We sing it, we say it, you pray it, right? God is love. Safest answer you can give if you fall asleep in an RE class or catechism class or an, even a mass, <laughs> God is love, right? And it's, oh, this is so holy. And <laughs> I've just fallen asleep. The other one's Jesus. Who's your hero? Jesus is my hero. Um, and, you know, and it's so holy. And so uh, this is quite an amazing statement, though, because to think that God would love us is pretty profound. That's an amazing thing. But God is love itself. That's what the statement is declaring. How the heck is that possible? Well, let's explore that because as we heard this morning in Mass, God is not a solitary being. God is a trinity. God is the Father engaged in an eternal act of self-giving love. But for love to be love, it has to be reciprocal. Received in, in fullness and returned in equal measure. And the only person capable of receiving the fullness of God's love and returning it in equal measure is Jesus, the Son, and the love between the Father and the Son is so profound, it is fruitful, and, and, and we call it the Holy Spirit. That's who our God is. This, this is so, so hugely important when you go back to that thing of, of we are made in the image and likeness of God. So what this means is that there was an eternal communion of self-giving love before anything else even existed. What this means is that there was community, there was family, there was love, there was self-giving, and everything in creation flowed out of that. That's profound. So, going back again, if we are made in the image and likeness of God, sorry, no going forward, sorry, it's not. <laughs> Alrighty, if we're made in the image of God, and God is a community of self giving love, then what are we made for? We're made for self giving, we're made for love, and we're made for community. And that's why the devil has been so successful in this area, and this is why the devil has gone after community. Because every functioning community where people are giving of themselves to others is a flesh and blood reminder of the Trinity, and he hates it. Every family is a flesh and blood reminder of the Trinity, and he hates it. This is, and you know what he's done? He has destroyed community for so many people. And without community, what you end up with is a situation where, uh, first of all, our, our view of, 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 uh, of God and his calling starts to become distorted. We start to think that God just wants to relate to us in a sort of solo kind of way. That's all about our autonomy. That success within the spiritual life is achieving autonomy when it's not. It's achieving community. 
We start to think that it's all about self-gratification. If it feels good, then I'll trust it. If it doesn't feel good, this becomes often the way of discerning things, which is not actually necessarily the correct way of discerning something at all. What else starts to happen? We also start to have our spiritual growth and, and our ability to love is harmed and stunted. Why? Because you can't love unless there are other people to draw you and call you out of yourself. You need to have other people. You need community. And you can't do community with self-gratification as your primary goal. Why? Because people are annoying. They will frustrate you. And it's good. It's the way it's supposed to be. My wife and I annoy the heck out of each other. We are at each other's crosses. It's a beautiful cross. I love my cross to bits. And she loves hers to bits. Some days, though, it's a bit spiky. A little bit of a cactus, right? And that's the way it's supposed to be because it calls us to love and to be more like Christ. But without people around, our ability to love, and God does his most effective work in our spiritual growth through other people. So without other people around us, what happens? Our spiritual growth starts to become stunted too. And lastly, we end up with a situation where the culture of death takes a real stronghold. Because all of a sudden, if you've got no community around you, abortion isn't just a choice. Abortion looks like a necessity. If you get an unplanned pregnancy, I've got no option but to do this. Because who else is around me to care for me and love me through this situation? Euthanasia starts to look really necessary as well. Family starts to become almost impossible because what happens is people are working, we, we become autonomous self-choosing individuals, we're separated away from families, an extended family, we're separated away from local community, we're separated away from church. And so what do we do? We work a million hours as individuals, that maybe a husband and a wife, striving just, just to pay for a mortgage to get a house, to own a house, and we go, how the heck are we going to afford kids? And then you work in a million hours once you've got the house and one of your parents or an elderly relative gets sick and you start to think, how the heck are we going to afford to pay for their care? See, all of a sudden euthanasia becomes a really effective tool to solve that problem. In fact, in Canada, when they legalised euthanasia in 2016, within a couple of months of legalising euthanasia in Canada in 2016, a massive public report by a group of experts had been published, and they said this, the good news is that we will save between uh, 18 and $139 million everywhere in healthcare costs because of euthanasia. It was widely published, it was in the papers, everyone's like, oh great, this is good. It's, uh, what, $1.4 billion every 10 years. It's a very effective incentive to keep something like that going. That is the culture of death, and it takes hold with that community. Now, as if all of that wasn't enough of an issue, we also have a problem there in the church. The church is in crisis. Let's not sugarcoat it. It is in the West. The church is in crisis. The, the abuse crisis is just an absolute mess. And, and I can see by your nodding that everyone's going, yep, yep, you don't need to tell us that. Pick a country. Aussie, USA, South America, Germany, New Zealand. We just lost a bishop about a month and a half ago. For dodgy behaviour, gone. Young bishop, gone, Bergen. Right? And we've only got six of them in New Zealand. Right? It's pretty serious. I remember I was working for the church back in the two, early 2000s when the whole abuse crisis kicked off in America. And, it, the, and, and we all thought it had been resolved. And it hadn't been. And in fact, what we've discovered in the last year or so is that the lack of accountability was even worse than everyone had feared. And it's an absolute mess. What's also happened is that the lack of community in our culture has now crept into the church. And we now often approach Mass as consumers instead of worshippers coming into a community. It's like, okay, well where's my five rousing hymns and my, my one good homily? I'm putting money in this plate, baby, and I expect good outcomes. And if I don't get that I'm going somewhere else, I'll give them my money. That's what a consumer does. Where's the HR department? Where's the human rights department? Where's the complaints department I can complain to about this, right? You know? <laughs> the French Council, bingo. Right? So, what, that's the exact opposite of how we're supposed to approach things as people who are part of a community. A, a, part, a person who's part of a community says, how can I give of myself to this community? Not what's in it for me. And, and this loss of community isn't just in that area, the fact that we're consumers. I was sitting in, in Mass recently thinking to myself, you know what, if, if my house burnt down, would I rely more on these people around me who I come to Mass with every Sunday morning, or would I rely more on my insurance corporation to come to my aid? And it was frightening because I realised it was the corporation that I relied more on than my worshipping community. Something's not right with that. Something's not right with that. And then lastly, and this is a big one, we're not evangelising. There's pockets of evangelism happening, for sure. And when we see them, we're like, wow, that's amazing. But, but it's not happening like it should be. Mission is our core mission. 
as Catholics, and it's, it's, you go to most parishes, where is it? If it's happening at all, it sort of relies on a very small minority of people who are trying desperately to drive something. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to corral and whip and beat the rest of the parish into joining them. Like, there's no sense of mission there. Thank you very much. Where has it gone? We've, we've formed a holy little huddle. We sort of all get together, you know, batten down the hatches. Gates of hell shall not prevail if we build another wall. Right, you know? And so, and, 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 and we're, we're like, this is great. Why don't people see the joy of Catholicism? You know, we're all wandering around looking like we just lost our last friend and got baptized in vinegar. And it's like, why don't they, why don't they love Jesus? Sinners, right? <laughs> Filthy sinners. Now, despite all of this, because if this talk ended right now, you'd be like, oh gosh, that was just awful, you know? Like, oh. <laughs> everyone, we're having Prozac for lunch, okay? So, enjoy. Right? It would be just, it'd be heinous if that was it. But the good news is that that's not it, and, and there is still hope. Big bright pink there, you know? I love pink, especially on Gaudete Sunday. Um, but um, what, why should we have hope? Why should we have hope? Well, there's things in our society that point to this hope. I'll tell you one thing that, that, that to me is a sign of hope, and it's this guy here. I'll tell you why this is... Oh, now, please, I'm not deifying him saying, Oh, St. Jordan, oh, you know, <laughs> give me his relics. Some people want his relics now. <coughs> Take his head. <laughs> um, and so, um, Jordan, Jordan Peterson, right? I'll tell you why there's a hope in this. Before he turned up on the scene, we were all busy convincing ourselves, oh, the culture doesn't want to hear any hard truths. We're going to just water it all down, make a nice, milky, lukewarm Jesus. Let's pretend that scripture in the book of Revelation about, you know, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Pretend that doesn't exist. What they really want is lukewarm Jesus. And we'll serve it up to them, this milky gray thing, and they'll love it. And the culture goes, why? I could join a golf club and then I don't have to get out of bed early on a Sunday if I want people to hang out with on the weekends, if that's all that, you know. If all you're offering me is Jesus as Tony Robbins, you know, your life coach, then that's not good enough because I can get Tony Robbins to do that. Jesus is a saviour. That's a whole different kettle of fish and saviours ask us to do hard things. What, what happens with Jordan Peterson though is he comes along and he, he, he writes a self-help book. Now there's things I critique about Peterson. He's got a bit of the Pelagian heresy in him, you know, sort of save yourself stuff. But there's lots that's really good about him as well. And, and one of the things about Peterson is he's, he's, he's told some really hard truths to the culture. And he has also written a self-help book that effectively says, if you want to find meaning in life, you've got to suffer. And people buy this book. It becomes a bestseller wherever it goes on sale. That tells me the culture is looking for substance. They're and they're willing to actually embrace and listen to hard answers. Go and watch. Uh, Bishop Robert Barron did a YouTube video where just only about seven or eight minutes where he reviewed Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Go and look at the comment section. There's person after person who says, I came to Christianity because of Jordan Peterson. <laughs> what? He's not a Christian. I, came to, I became a Christian because of him. And the church is like, <laughs> what's the secret? You know? it's like, and, and, and then they say, and I became a Catholic because of you, Bishop Robert Barron. I found Bishop Robert Barron through him, and then, then I became a Catholic. Like, they, this is evangelism, right? This is, there's hope in this. People are looking for substance. The other reason we can have hope is because we've been here before. We heard this morning about a period in church history that was absolutely diabolical. The French Revolution, just atrocious. The brutality and the evil of that. And, and it seemed that all was lost. St. Benedict of Nursia, the whole empire collapsed, but built intentional community in the midst of that. And, and, and Europe was built on the back of those, uh, those, that monastic life, on the back of those Benedictine monasteries, that intentional community. St. Francis and St. Clair. And another two is, is these two fellows here that I want to tell you about now is, is Gerhard and Thomas. Gerhard group. This, sort of, this is the period around 1340 to 1471. Then let me just tell you about what's going on in the world at this period. The Black Plague, <laughs> that little thing I like to call the Black Death, right? And if no one knows why, what's going on, it's just awful. Wipes out like the millions. And it's like, what the heck is this thing? And it's wiped out millions of people, does untold damage. We have uh, wars and riots. The Hundred Years' War is going on, just constant war. Very frightening taxation revolts. Peasants are just randomly sort of revolting and violent revolts against taxation. And so it's a pretty hard time in the world. And the church is in crisis. At one point we have three popes, or three people claiming to be pope in the church, right? Imagine that World Youth Day, you know? <laughs> I'm the pope. 
<laughs> Actually, I'm the Pope. Those guys are losers and I'm saying the final mass, right? Imagine that. It would be a disaster. This is the state of the world. Now, the first person in this mess is Gerhard Groot. Gerhard Groot is a guy who walks away from a, from a very prestigious career as a secular educator to become basically a humble street preacher. And he, he trudges the streets, the dale and snow, and, and wherever he goes, his message is pretty simple and it's the same wherever he goes. Love God, read the scriptures, live like Jesus. Just that, that's the heart of his message over and over again. It doesn't matter whether you are a pauper or whether you're a king or whether you're a bishop. He'll tell you that message. Apparently he's such a good orator that the, the scholars tell us that people would leave hot meals on the table to go and hear him speak in the town square. Now Gerhard Groot, what happens is a religious community is formed around this, this, uh, this charism that he's got. And they're called the Brothers of Common Life. And this is where a second figure, a second character. So what do they do? They send him off to live with the brothers of common life. And while he's there, he has a profound encounter with Christ that is transformative, that transforms his life. Thomas Merkin goes on to write one of the most important and widely read pieces of literature in Christian history. We heard about it yesterday morning, The Imitation of Christ. Thomas Akempis, Thomas of Kempis. Kempis is the German town where he's from. Think about that. In the midst of all of that darkness and mess, Gerhard Groot and Thomas. And you know what's interesting about this? First of all is the fact that it's built around and this evangelism happens in community. Community is essential. Secondly, and this is really important as well, you've probably heard of Thomas Akempis. You certainly have if you were here yesterday morning. Oh, Thomas Akempis, yeah, I'm, I haven't read it yet, but The Imitation of Christ, I've heard it. You should read it, by the way. It is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. But here's the thing, if you ask people, have you heard of Gerhard Groot? Nope, never heard of that guy. But without Gerhard, without that community, there's no Thomas. We all wander around thinking, oh, I'm supposed to be like Thomas, you know, everyone's going to know my name, I'm going to be so amazing in my evangelism, I'm going to write the next big book, it's going to be bigger than Augustine, it's going to be amazing. And in actual fact, most of us are called to be like Gerhard. We're there to do that faithful work and then the fruit will come later. And I think that's the period of history we're in right now. How do we actually build that thing, which is, and this is why I'm so committed to the work that I do. I very clearly understand that my calling is to actually build, to form and equip leaders for the culture of life who will be there in 15, 20, 30, 40 years time to pick up the pieces when our society is finally crumbled. Here's the thing, I don't think the West is crumbling. Some people say, you know, do, do you think these, these things are signs of a society in trouble? I think they are symptoms of a culture that has already collapsed. We've just got money. And we've got entertainment and an ability to numb ourselves to that reality. Our economic situation is different than it's ever been in human history. So we get to mask the reality. We get to bury ourselves in hedonism. And we don't realise that society has collapsed. And that's why we're seeing so many of the political bills and outcomes and ideological impositions that we are now seeing. Because things have collapsed. So what do we do in that? What's our calling? As I said, there's still great hope. So our calling is to be, as St. Catherine of Siena says, that we are supposed to be who God meant us to be and we will set the world on fire. That's our calling. So who are we supposed to be? Well, first of all, to quote uh, Pope Benedict, you are not some casual and meaningless product of biological forces. Every one of you is the result of a thought of God. Every one of you is willed. Every one of you is loved. Every one of you is necessary. You are essential to God's plan for salvation and you are meant to be here and your life has profound meaning. And a culture that just tells you you're just another one of the people, the plebs who sort of evolved out of the scum and, and how can you, what can you contribute to the economy if not, no, that's euthanasia. Right, if the, in that society, this is the message that we need to hear first and foremost. Now what are we supposed to do with this? We're not just supposed to wander around with the sort of self-esteem doctrine. Oh, I'm so special. <laughs> I'm super special, all right? That's not what it's supposed to be. There's also supposed to be another calling to it. There's a self-giving component. So what we're supposed to do is we are supposed to be salt and light. That's what Jesus tells us. You're supposed to go into the culture and be salty. Salty memes, right? And saltiness is a... No, not salty memes. You're supposed to be salty. What is salt? If, you haven't, if your palate is numbed, because you've been eating rubbish, when you taste salt, it's like, ugh, what is this? Oh, I'll get it off now, you know? That's what, that's what the truth is like to people who haven't heard it in a while. It seems, ugh, vile, disgusting. And light, ugh, get the light out of my eyes. If you've been living as a vampire, you don't want the sunlight initially. 
but you need it. It's good. It's cleansing. So we need to actually go and be salt and light and be a bit salty. And here's the thing. We're supposed to go and tell the world. What we do today with evangelism, often in our parishes, we adopt what I call the field of dreams approach to evangelism. If you've seen, has anyone seen the field of dreams? The movie with Kevin Costner. Okay, so great classic movie from the 80s and or early 90s. And, and this film, in Field of Dreams, there's this guy who's got a corn farm and he has this vision and he keeps hearing this in this vision, if you build it, they will come. And so he builds a baseball diamond in his cornfield, and they are all these amazing superstars from yesteryear turn up, right? And it's like, if you build it, they will come. That's our approach to evangelism now. It's not go and tell the world, it's like, if we build it, they will come. Let's put on a program, and maybe if we're lucky, we'll stick a sign out the front, and then we wait. <laughs> it's like a weird sort of trap, you know? Are they, are they, are the sinner's coming, can anyone see? You know? No, no, well, we've got one, okay. And, and so we're like, why is this not effective? Because we're not going out into the culture. It's what we're supposed to be doing, go and tell. And lose your head if you're supposed to in the process, right? Go and tell all creation that he lives. And this calling, it's not given to you by a bishop or a priest. You, you were given this calling at your baptism. Go and read the catechism if you don't believe me. This is your baptismal calling. We are all baptised into the priesthood of the laity. Everyone today is running around, oh, we need to get more lay people on the sanctuary. No, that's not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to come to the sanctuary, receive our fill, and then go out into the world. That's our century, quote-unquote. We're supposed to do what priests are supposed to do out in the world. Take unclean things and consecrate them to Christ and make them holy. We're supposed to do that in our culture. That's our calling, and it happened at baptism. Basically, we are all called to be bridge builders and tour guides. Brendan, what the heck is this all about? <laughs> What's going on here? Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. So first of all, on one side here, we have basically what you might call the precipice of need. You've got the hungry, the broken, and the lost sheep who are desperately looking for something. They're buying Jordan Peterson because they're looking for an answer. They desperately are looking for an answer. And the answer that they're looking for, of course, is Christ. But the gap between them and him, and they don't even realize that, they, that the gap is there often. They probably don't even know who he is half the time. And our job is to be the bridge builders. It's our evangelization which actually creates the bridge. And we're supposed to be like tour guides who journey across that bridge with them. We just say, there you go. We journey with people on that journey. Right? So first of all, every bridge is going to be different. Not everyone's going to step out onto the same sort of bridge. People are in different places and we've got to recognize there's no magic formula to this. It's about relationship. And relationships are messy things because individuals are individuals. And they have their own issues and brokenness and everything else. You've just got to work with them and love them where they're at. Second thing is, it's about proposing, not imposing. Get into the church, you heathens. That's imposing, right? Proposing is, hey, look at our lives. Look at the goodness and the truth and the beauty that we've got. Let me tell you about it, how awesome it is. I'm here to propose something to you. So what that means is that basically... We are bridge builders, not pirates. You know, walk the plank, me hearties, for Jesus. Okay, we are bridge builders, not pirates. And here's the thing about bridges. If you're going to step out onto a bridge, it needs to be robust truth. It cannot be cat poster philosophy. Eh, live your dreams for Jesus. You know, like you know those cat posters that you see on the internet, right? Live your dreams. What is that? Take the cat out of that cat poster, put Adolf Hitler in there and leave the phrase there, live your dreams, and what have you got? You've got a recipe for disaster. So it's about more than just living your dreams, right? If you're going to step out onto a bridge, you've got to know that it's going to support your way. Goodness, truth, and beauty are absolutely essential. Without those, what have we got? G.K. Chesterton once said this. He wrote a famous letter to the editor, in fact. And the editor of his local paper had written this big scathing editorial. He said, the world is in crisis. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. What's gone wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton wrote a letter to the editor and he said, Dear Sue, you've asked what's wrong with the world. I am. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. That's it. We look at the church. What's wrong with the church? What could be done better? Us. Us. Do you know what Pope Benedict said? The new evangelism, the new evangelization begins in the confessional. The new evangelization begins in the confessional. Think about your own life now. If they outlaw Christianity tomorrow in Australia and they started arresting people for the crime of Christianity, would there be enough evidence to convict you of the crime if you were arrested and charged? That's a scary question. I, I'm scared by that question. And we should be. It's a good thing to be afraid of. Would they arrest you and people say, Oh no, don't be stupid. He's not a Catholic. No. No, she's not. You want to see them on Friday and Saturday nights. No, no, no. 
Or would they say, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> Filthy hope, always happy, you know, even joyful. Even in dark times, they seem to have this weird underlying joy. Something not right about that, suspicious. You know, and they had these weird little beads, and they were, just what's going on with these people, right? Would they say, I knew it, or would they say, no, that's not true? Would there be enough evidence to convict us of, of Christianity? Here's the thing, we, we live in this culture, and, and like... The, the, the hammer blows of the culture of death are just constantly raining down. And we sort of don't know how to respond. And we think, what do we do? What do we do here? And it's very easy to lose hope. But here's the thing. I would actually say that we're supposed to be an anvil of self-giving love in that cultural situation. So the hammer blows are raining down. And we think, oh, we can't do anything. This ideology, it's shaping the metal, the culture around us. Guess what? If you're an anvil and you hold your ground and you don't swing back, but you hold your ground in self-giving love, you get to shape the metal as well. Not just the hammer blows, but you get to actually have an influence on shaping the culture too. How do we do that? It's through self-giving love. Remember St. Maximilian Kolbe? What happens to St. Maximilian Kolbe? He gets arrested and put into Auschwitz concentration camp. And while he's there, there are a group of men who escape one night. And so the, 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 the barbaric Germans decide that what they're going to do is that they're going to randomly select and it's nine people to be killed as a lesson that you don't escape. Or we'll just randomly select anyone and kill them. They pick nine people, and one of the men they pick is a father with children, and he cries out, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. He's totally innocent. He says, I've got, I've got a wife and kids. What about my wife and kids? And so, so Maximilian Colby steps forward, and he says, take me in his place. Take me instead. Total abandonment to Christ and the cross. And so they do. And they take him away, and they lock him up in a cell with a group of men, and he's in the cell, and he just won't die. They keep praying. He leads them in prayer and singing hymns. This is something beautiful about a lot of these saints. St. Teresa Benedicta, who we named our youngest daughter after, uh, Edith Stein, when she went to Auschwitz, her final moments, she was comforting children who their mothers had abandoned on the trains because they were so just um, destroyed by what they knew was coming. And she gathered these children around it, and she was giving spiritual comfort to people as they walked into the gas chambers. There's something profound about this. And, and he won't die, and so eventually, finally, they go in there and they inject carbolic acid right into his heart to kill him, because he just won't die. You know what St. Maximilian Colby said about our calling? He said this, Love lives through sacrifice and is nourished by giving. Without sacrifice, there is no love. What's he saying? He's saying that we're supposed to embrace this. And embracing your cross is not an easy thing to do. There's no such thing as a posturepedic cross, as my dad used to say to me. It's not an easy thing. You know, comfort, shoulder pad, you know, little wheel on the back. doesn't exist. It's a hard thing, and some days the splinters from that bad boy, they just dig in and it really hurts. Some days it's like embracing that cactus, and the cactus just embraces back. And it's not easy. In fact, I think if we were honest, we'd probably like a cross that worked kind of like this. A Christian calling kind of like a microwave. Nice, easy, simple, and just so quick and easy. It's a perfect male cooking device. Sorry, go back one. Uh, if you, you put your food in, you press a few buttons, ding, it's done. You can even go to the supermarket and buy a whole meal, and all you have to do is tear off the, the plastic and, and just put that in. It's, I mean, this doesn't get any easier than that, right? And I'm done. I embraced it. Now what do I do next? But that's not what our calling's like. Our calling is more like using one of these. This is a hungi, traditional Māori way of cooking food in New Zealand. And what you do with a hungi is you dig a big pit in the ground, first of all. You've got to dig a hole in the ground. There's no power involved. It's manpower. You dig a hole in the ground, and then you light a fire in the pit, and then what you do is you put rocks onto the embers, and you heat the rocks, and then you prepare the food, and you wrap the food. If it's traditional, you'd wrap it in leaves, otherwise they'd wrap it in wet sacks and other things. You bury the food in the ground, and you cover it over with earth, and then you wait for hours for it to cook. And then you're really hungry, and you've got to dig it out of the ground before you can eat it. It's the exact opposite of a microwave. It's a marathon, not a sprint. That's our calling. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's not just one thing you do, and then I'm done. It is this constant seeking to actually give of ourselves. For me, one of my biggest challenges comes at 2 a.m. 2 a.m., my kids are crying out, Dad, Dad. Come and give me something I don't really need at 2 a.m. Right? And, 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 and I'm lying there and I've got an option. I can lie there real still, pretend I'm asleep, and my wife is a real light sleeper. I hope she goes and deals with it. Or in that moment, I can respond to that little voice of the Holy Spirit that says, Brendan, don't be a bum. Get out of bed. Love your wife. That's how the Holy Spirit talks to me. Don't be a bum. Get out of bed. Love your wife. Love your kids. Stumble around in the dark and get into their room and say, what's going on? How can I help? Love them. 
Now that's not easy. Because none of you are there to see me do that. Hopefully you're not there, because at 2am in my bedroom, if you're there, the children of the corn looking at us sleep, something's gone horribly wrong. But you're not there to see that. No one's going to write a book about that or make a movie. The man who got up at 2am to his children. He was the hero Gotham needed. No one is going to write that book. Integrity is who we are, though, when no one else is looking. That's what self-giving love. You know, in that moment, though, I'm actually in the school of the cross in that moment. And so the question we need to keep asking ourselves is this. This is the magic formula. Ask yourself this question every moment of every day. Whenever you remember. You'll forget to do it, don't worry, I forget all the time. But try and ask yourself this question as as much as possible. How do I love more authentically in this moment? How do I love more authentically in this moment? And whether that's sitting in traffic and letting the person beside you in, maybe even giving them a polite smile and a wave, asking someone at the supermarket, how's your day? And, and genuinely ask, and wanting to know the answer. Or whether that's something big, like being in a concentration camp and stepping forward and saying, I will take the place of that man. How can I love more authentically? How can I be more like Christ in this moment? And what that means is that we have to be like these two little fellows here. My two favourite characters in all the literature. The hobbits, Frodo and Sam. Now think about the hobbits and, and the story of Lord of the Rings. They are given the most important task in all of Middle-earth in that story. Take the ring of power, walk into the heart of Mordor, walk up to the mount and throw it in Mount Defiles of Mount Doom and destroy it. Save the whole world. They are the most ill-equipped for that job. They really truly are. They don't have like uh, military prowess like the riders of Rohan, the armies of men. They don't have this angelic majesty about them like the elves. They don't have powers like the, the wizards do. The hobbits. They are short, they have hairy feet, and they eat a lot of food. And I really relate. It's my my spiritual self. right? And so um, I see myself in these little dudes. But you know what else hobbits have? They have humility. Humility is the hallmark of the hobbits. And you know what else they had in that story? They had community. It was a fellowship that actually saved the world. Not just one person. J.R.R. Tolkien put it like this in The Lord of the Rings. When Frodo was asking, man, I wish this wasn't my lot in life. And then Gandalf says to him, so Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides those of evil. That's true. That's hope. The other thing he says in the Fellowship of the Ring is this. This is the hour of the Shire folk, when they arise from their quiet fields to shake the towers and councils of the great. Some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check, but that is not what I have found. It is the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. We are the Shire folk. And this is how we shake the councils of the wicked and the great. It is time for you to rise up from your fields and actually start loving. Be who you are meant to be and you will set the world on fire. Let me finish just quickly with a couple of little points. One of the greatest moments of tragedy in the Gospels is this one here, I think. It is the rich young man. Think about this, what happens to the rich young man. He comes to Jesus and he says, Master, what must I do to be saved? Now, when we hear that story in the outcome, we think, oh, rich people and their money. Oh, yeah. If that's all you think, you've missed the whole heart of what's going on here. There's something much more profound and tragic going on here. So he comes to Jesus. He's not a doubter. He's not a skeptic. He's not Richard Dawkins. Let me tell you where you're wrong, right? He is genuinely seeking truth. What must I do to be saved, Master? And then Jesus says to him, live the commandments. Love God. Love your neighbor. And he says, I do that. And we know that it's true because the scriptures tell us Jesus looked at him with love. This was also a good man. He's not a a sinner. He's not a heathen. He's a good man and he wants the truth. And then Jesus says, sell everything you have, give your money to the poor and come follow me. And what happens? He can't do it. This is the really profound moment that we often miss. He walked away sad. That's what the scriptures tell us. He didn't walk away angry like you would normally expect. Oh, what would that guy know? How crazy is that? He didn't walk away saying to himself, Oh, this Jesus doesn't understand economics like I do. We could do some amazing... We could have a massive social media outreach if we kept all of my money. He doesn't say that. 
He walks away sad. Why would he be sad? Because he's trapped. He can't give himself to the truth. And he's sad, I think, because he wants to. He came looking to give himself to Christ. But what happened? He'd become a slave to something that controlled him. And he couldn't give of himself. And here's the thing. If you don't learn to give of yourself, you will become a slave to something that you did not choose like that rich young man. Bob Dylan, one of my favorite Bob Dylan songs, he says, everybody serves somebody. Maybe the devil, it may be the Lord, but everybody serves somebody. So who are you going to serve? Imagine that rich young man. Was, was he supposed to be one of the gospel writers? We don't know. He walked away sad. Was he supposed to journey with St. Paul? Were we supposed to know who he was and read his writings in the New Testament? We don't know. He walked away sad. That is a profound tragedy because Christ wasn't just calling him in that moment. There was a whole other calling behind that that was meant to unfold as well that he walked away from. Think about that. That is, to me, one of the most tragic moments in the Gospels. Let me finish with a little anecdote, a little story. There was once a beggar who used to sit at the gates of a city in the Middle East, and all he had to his name was an old blanket that he would sit on, the clothes that he wore, and an old tin cup that he would beg into. And he only lived off whatever he was able to beg into that <coughs> on that day into the tin cup. And this particular day, he's got 10 grains of rice sitting in the cup. That's all he's managed to be. So things are pretty desperate. All of a sudden, off in the distance, he sees this massive dust cloud begin to kick up. And he sees horses and carriages and carav this massive caravan, footmen and ladies and waiting and soldiers. This is the most impressive convoy he's ever seen in his life before. So he starts waving his cup because he thinks, this is my chance. Please, sir, give me something. Give me anything. Take pity on me, a poor beggar. Give me something, please. Finally, the last carriage comes to a halt right beside him. These beautiful, uh, rich red curtains draw aside. These ornate wooden steps drop down. And out steps the richest, most impressive sultan that this man has ever seen before in his life. This king has the finest robes on. He's got rings on every finger. This king looks at him. He puts out his cup and he says, Please, sir, take pity on me, a poor beggar. Give me something. Give me anything. The king looks at him and says, What's that cup? He says, This is my begging cup, your highness. I, whatever I, I, I beg into this cup, that's all I have to live off each day. And the king says, what have you got in your cup today? He says, I've got 10 grains of rice, that's it. Puts the cup out again, please give me something, give me anything. The king looks at him and he says, I'll tell you what, how many grains of rice will you let me take from your cup? The beggar takes a step backwards and thinks, what? This rich and powerful man who has everything that I can see before me, and he wants something from me? How dare he? dare he? And he gets angry, but then all of a sudden he looks around, he sees the soldiers, and he thinks, this man's very powerful. This could go really badly for me if I don't at least give him something. So he puts on a fake smile, hands in the cup, and says, you can take two grains of rice, your highness. The king reaches in, takes his two grains of rice, hands the cup back to the beggar. He climbs up the steps. The steps draw up. The curtains close. The soldiers wave, and off they go again. This beggar is standing there now in absolute, utter disbelief. 45 minutes later, he's still standing stunned. As the last of the convoy disappears over the far horizon, the dust is all settled, he's all alone now, and now he is angry. And in a fit of rage, he throws the cup at the ground as hard as he can. How dare he? He screams. The cup hits the ground and out flies those eight grains of rice. And two of the biggest, most expensive, most precious diamonds he's ever seen in his life before. And in that instant he thinks to himself, what a fool I've been. If only I had given him more. If only I had given him more. My challenge to you is, don't be like the beggar, don't be like the rich young man. Don't go away from those opportunities to love. Don't be afraid to give of what is in your cup. And you might be looking at your cup and thinking, what have I got to offer? These humble little grains of rice, I'm full of brokenness, I've got sins, I've got struggles. What have I got to offer? You're one of the shy folk. Your humility and, and being willing to offer over your cup to Christ in love and say, take what I've got and use it. You know what he'll do? He will take it and he will use it and he will produce the most profound riches for his kingdom. But he will never force us. He loves us. It is always an act of self-giving love. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
Whoever opens the door, I will eat with them and they will eat with me. Beautiful Eucharistic scripture. It's Jesus, right, obviously. He doesn't say, behold, I stand at the door and pick the lock. I knock. I'm waiting for you to respond. But if we do that, and we are willing to give over our cup, and we are willing to give all that we have, then he will take that, and he will use that, and you will transform the culture. Because here's the thing. The Talmud, the Jewish Talmud says this. If you save one life, you save the whole world. You change one thing, you've changed everything. That's all you have to do. Go and change the culture around you, and you have changed the world. And we can all do that. But we can only do that with Christ. You guys are awesome. Thank you for listening this week.